welcome uh, to this conversation about how to capture an offender's use of coercive control within an intimate partner uh, relationship. This is part of our intimate partner violence prosecution series. And I'm once again here with my colleague, Jonathan Curland. Thank you for being here. Hi, everybody. Um, we're um, both attorney advisors at Equitas, an organization that's funded through various grants to provide you with innovative, informed, and hopefully really practical strategies that you can apply to your work almost immediately. We do that in many different ways, including this series, um, which is a 10 part series, all on um, how to prosecute um, intimate partner violence. And we also have larger scale webinars, articles, other publications on our website. We participate in training events, everything from small single office trainings to larger um, statewide, national, even sometimes international trainings. One of the things that Jonathan and I, I know appreciate the most is our opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with prosecutors. Those of you that are in the field doing this work day after day, and it's our honor to serve as, I don't know, a sounding board if you've got those case specific issues or want to just discuss a strategy um, or maybe voir dire questions, and we're always available for that type of consultation. Equitas is also involved in many um, national partnerships and initiatives, including the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, uh, the Enhanced Collaborative Model Human Trafficking Task Force Initiative, and uh, Innovative Prosecution Solution Grants. Please learn more about us by visiting our website, which is at www.equitasresource.org, or follow us along any of the uh, social media platforms we use, where we're trying to push out the latest research or training opportunities um, or um, sort of webinars. Um, great way to stay connected with us and engage with the resources that are really developed for you, um, free for you, and hopefully helpful for your practices. This project in particular is supported by a grant we have through the Office on Violence Against Women, the US Department of Justice. Um, we really appreciate their support, although not everything we say is necessarily in line with their, their views. All of our work is strives to be uh, really informed and innovative, along with promising practices. And so we'll often be sharing <sighs> others' work uh, through the fair use doctrine. So today, uh, coercive control sort of expanding what we know of as our typical intimate partner relationship and really getting into some of maybe the less obvious, um, more coercive tactics that offenders use in these abusive relationships. Uh, once we identify this course, this course of control tactics being used, we wanna make sure we can preserve and admit it into evidence. And there's a couple of different theories under which we can do that, including charging stalking and other um, crimes that are indicative of that coercive control. So first off, I wanted to share this maze of coercive control. Um, it is sort of a reimagination and expansion of the original power control wheel, which the first of our series delved into spoke by spoke. So it obviously pays homage to that original power and control wheel and it sort of expands it, uh, maybe updates it. There's a little bit more information on here about stalking, about the use of technology and social media. Um, and again, it's just a resource, I think. And Jonathan, um, as a prosecutor, how might you use this resource in your work? Well, I, I think the biggest challenge in, in intimate partner violence cases is that when we approach it as just an episode that we responded to, uh, we're not really giving a, a, us an, an opportunity to understand the whole story or tell the whole story to the court and a jury. And really part of that is, is sort of 
checking our own assumptions at the door and realizing that when we get that uh, that domestic violence case, that uh, simple battery or simple assault or something of that nature, is that there's a whole com complex story and in, in web behind that. And using some of the cues in something like a power and control wheel or more uh, up to date or appropriately a, a power and control maze, uh, which is what we have here, we can start asking some of those questions to appreciate that complexity. Uh, because of course the challenge is if we minimize it to just an episodic uh, response that, that, that we're managing, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to bring justice to the victim or accountability to the offender. And we're certainly going to make it a lot uh, easier for the offender to change the narrative when the matter is proceeding through, through litigation or through trial. Uh, because it's going to be that episodic response that really minimizes what's happening, which is really a, a cycle of power and control that's been that's been exercised by the offender through various outlets, including the episode we're responding to or that prompted law enforcement response or the system involvement, but as well a lot of other things that haven't been captured uh, that maybe was reported and fell through because of attrition uh, that was never reported because the victim felt afraid or just it was normalized to the victim in a lot of ways. Uh, so that they're not even considering that. And so we should be, when we get that episode of a dim, an intimate partner violence case, um, we should really be asking what else happened and mm -hmm. be digging deep because almost all the time, there's going to be a lot else that happened. And a lot of times the law will give us mechanisms to bring that forth if we if we just seek. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was on purpose or not, but one of the things I like about this maze Although I do find it sometimes a little hard to, to capture everything, it's not quite as uh, succinct, but for good reason, um, is that it almost shows uh, the ripple effect of coercive control on a victim. So as we go out on these wider and wider circles, we start seeing things like blended families, trauma, disability, uh, immigration, um, clubs, teams, groups, social circles, so that the core of this is not just with the victim and the offender and that core relationship, but we see the ripple effects. And when we work with survivors and victims of intimate partner violence, I think that really um, speaks to how much these crimes affect every single part of their lives. Well, just in a way, think about it, but it, it's, it makes sense in a way when we sort of approach it from this perspective of this, even our own individual lives are really complex. We're not just our jobs. We're not just our relationships. We're not just our, our interests, uh, but we're lots of things and we're different things at different times. Mm -hmm. Intimate partner crime by its nature, it, it, I guess the, the key word here is intimate is you're having offenders and victims that are intertwined in one another's lives and all aspects of, our, our, of their lives. So as prosecutors or law enforcement, we might just be helicoptering in on uh, whatever prompted the 911 call, uh, but the dynamics and complexities that gave rise and gave, give shape and that react to that episode are, are pervasive and, and rippling, as you talk mm -hmm. about. Uh, throughout the victims' lives and the offenders' lives, because the, the intimate partner crimes are just that. The offender and victims' lives are going to be intertwined and be touching on all these different areas beyond what we're, and I worry it sounds too derisive, beyond what we're helicoptering in on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how can we use that resource, that tool, the maze that we just showed you, how can we use that as a tool to actually do a better job and identify these complex coercive tactics that are touching all of these elements of the victim's lives and really probably affecting their ability to participate in this process with us because of all these sort of obstacles and barriers that this these control tactics put in the way. Well, I, I think, the, the first thing is, and there's, there's a wonderful Venn diagram illustrating the specifics, but I think the first one is an approach of humility that, that that power and control maze helps illustrate of 
humility in recognizing they're going to be known unknowns here and that we should have our antenna up for these other collateral, not, not collateral, that's not the right word, that sounds too minimizing, uh, these other correlating issues to what we're responding to and that are going to impact participation and might be wider scope than this one specific episode we're responding here to. Um, but I, I love this is set up as a Venn diagram because I don't think any one of these methods is sufficient in of themselves, but to some degree they'll ideally overlap as well. But I mean, certainly interviewing, interviewing the victim and finding out and asking these questions that are go beyond just the episode prompting the response, but asking about all these deeper, more involved, more complete uh, holistic type questions are going to find, but that's limited too, that you can find out a lot, but it's going to be limited because of course the victim might be ashamed, uh, some of the abuse or pattern might be normalized to them, so it's not going to be complete. So again, we're going to be relying on other methods such as that investigation uh, method, and the, by investigation, I'm thinking of something more complete than maybe just to approach, let's see what the victim says, let's see what the offender says. But ideally, finding out what neighbors say, uh, finding out what the kids in the household say and evaluating if that's appropriate, what other friends and family are saying, uh, what do employers say, uh, what, does, uh, the, uh, what, what does the offender's devices say, what does el electronic evidence say, um, what else can we do to build up our case and, and, and support the victim? And also collaboration too, and collaboration, not just law enforcement and prosecution working together, but also working with our partners in, in the medical community, uh, but also system and community-based advocacy uh, so that we can get our support system available for the victim and hopefully increase the opportunity for them to participate in investigation and participation uh, to inve in an investigation and prosecution. And um, and, and, and also try to do something as more of a, a 360 view of a just outcome here, which is part of that is certainly holding the offender accountable, uh, but trying to give the victim a, a life and a new beginning when that happens, if that can happen. Yeah, I, I, I want to just share how that works sometimes with systems-based advocacy, because <coughs> I remember a case where we sort of opened up a whole nother section of the victim's life and something that they were really challenged with that they didn't immediately identify as being part of the case. And that was when somebody asked, do you need transportation to the courthouse? Can, can you get here? And it comes out like, no, I don't have transportation. My driver's license, um, I can't, um, you know, my husband hasn't allowed me to renew it. I don't have access to a vehicle. Um, I've never been on public transportation. And all of a sudden it kind of ballooned out that this element of transportation was actually a, a really key part of how the victim had been isolated and how the victim had been controlled. And I wasn't really asking those questions, but because my service provider partner was saying, okay, how can we make sure you get to the courthouse? It all sort of opened up in that regard. So that collaboration is really key because our victim service professionals, they know this better than we do. They ask questions that are better going to elicit this. And sometimes they're, they're really looking at the, at the victim as this whole person trying to help them. And they're gonna then maybe get into some of these areas that we're just not as good at. Hopefully we continue to be, like you said, humble and continue to strive to be better at it. But that collaboration with those professionals where that is their one and only job, probably not their one and only job, but their focus um, can really enhance our ability to identify this type of evidence. So now we've identified it, what do we do with it at trial? <laughs> and I know we're going to go through these main three strategies, although there's probably, there's probably a lot more. Um, so when we talk about other crimes or acts, this is the federal um, rule of evidence. But how do you view this, the efficacy of doing this and what types of things you can get here and why this is so key? Well, and, and I, I, I'm more prejudiced towards stalking as we're gonna talk to, and I think that's a better tool. Uh, but I don't wanna, but they can complement each other. And it, I don't think it has to be an either or type situation. 
Uh, but I, I think the good approach with an under, proper understanding of 404B evidence is that it's a rule of inclusion, not exclusion. And that concept is based on the idea that as long as we're not bringing in these other acts uh, to show the propensity of our offender, the propensity for them to commit the crime or just that they're a bad person in of itself, um, then it can come in as long as we're showing it for one of the enumerated proper purposes or a purpose that's proper, even if it's not enumerated like what we have here. And I, I think it's, there's really good arguments to make about why other acts, especially when they pertain uh, to, to the current victim, when the other acts pertain to the current victim, why they're gonna be, for, why they can be cast and, and framed in, in, in a proper purpose for under 404B. Motive, let's start with that. And I mean, this I think a lot of times complements intent, uh, which I know we're gonna later <laughs> Yeah. But a lot of these other acts, especially other past acts that are going to be committed by a perpetrator, um, they do go to show motive and intent. And I know motive and intent are distinct issues, but they do complement one another because someone with motive, evidence of motive can also be motive, evidence of intent. Um, but showing these other acts, these instances of power or control that independently of them themselves might not uh, give rise to a criminal violation. Uh, they can help be probative of what the offender's motive and intent was. And especially uh, when you have offenders that are going to be often committing their crimes without direct evidence of their intent or verbally expressing their intent, and we have to build it through inferential or, and circum or circumstantial evidence, um, then any kind of evidence uh, that we can use to prove motive intent becomes especially probative. I think and, those are probably like the top two that we use um, under 404B for our course of control relationships because the motive and the intent is to control the victim or to prevent the victim from seeking outside help. That's another one that you could articulate. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it is, could be, you know, knowledge because they knew where the victim was on a certain time because of this monitoring that they were doing or opportunity could be, you know, access to a weapon, um, absence of mistake, lack of accident. Sometimes that comes in as rebuttal evidence. I've seen that in our prosecutions. Um, identity is almost never the issue in a domestic violence case. I was going to say I'm late on examples for that in, in the IP <laughs> in the intimate partner violence context. That's not usually where we're going, um, but I think one of the reasons that 404B evidence can be really persuasive um, for lots of reasons because you want to be introducing this for the court. But before we get to your favorite, which is stalking, first off, stalking, the, the statutes are quite different when we look around the country. So you've got to figure out what your statute says. But I felt that my judges, defense attorneys, and juries did not understand that stalking could happen within the course of a relationship. It, to, there was like this, this block um, that stalking only happened after a breakup, after a cease of relationship, and then stalking was the aftermath. So I found it a bit of an uphill, um, depending on the evidence, depending on the circumstances, more of an uphill challenge to charge stalking when I was looking at the course of a relationship. I know it's possible. I know there's really great ways to make your arguments, but that was something I just wanted to bring up as a challenge and why 404B sometimes seemed to be an easier fit in, you know, in the brains, in the minds of my jury and my judges. And, you know, and I think probably another good use of 404B evidence, I, I don't know if it, if, I, if it necessarily has to be exclusive to 404B uh, type purposes or evidence, but that's not enumerated, is helping to understand the victim reactions and victim behaviors. Uh, like maybe why they're afraid to participate or why they don't want to participate. The, the context being offered through 404B evidence can help give a give a, a understanding as to why that is occurring. If there's victim behaviors that are challenged, either minimization, recantation, or just mm -hmm. not participating. 
I think that's really great to point out because A, 404B is a, is a rule of inclusion, which we often have to remind our, our judges of, and B, that these are not um, the extent of the reasons. And so to admit under the idea of, I wanna admit this evidence under the proper purpose of this evidence explains a delay in disclosure, or this evidence explains, you know, <clears throat> um, a piecemeal disclosure. Maybe um, the, you know, the evidence we want is that the offender was constantly threatening the victim with deportation. And we wanna explain why that victim was, <laughs> was afraid to talk to the police. Uh, that's not an enumerated reason, but it's definitely one that should be admissible under this because it's not propensity evidence and, uh, and it's a rule of inclusion. Good example. Now I'm going to let you talk about your favorite. <laughs> sure. Well, I was talking, I often think like one of the handicaps and sort of addressing the challenges you addressed is, is the title of stalking. Um, because it does sort of connotate the person in a trench coat or peeping Tom pervert type watching our victim uh, from a tree or something like that. Um, and, and that's the conception a lot of people have, but that's not the definition of the crime, either behavioral definition or what, uh, what matches with a lot of statutory definitions, uh, which is a pattern of behavior, which in some jurisdictions is called repeated acts, in some jurisdictions is gonna be called a course of conduct um, directed at a specific person, uh, sometimes at a specific person or their family or household member that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. Um, and that fear can be uh, exemplified, well, I, I don't wanna get ahead of myself about how it can be demonstrated. Well, I love that we use a behavioral definition because it allows us to have some working language to talk about stalking when our audience is a national one. Um, but really it is so imperative that if you are doing this work that you have a very good understanding of what your stalking statute actually requires and to do that statutory analysis because there's quite a bit of variety or variables here. So I see it as four key elements and I'm gonna ask you, Jonathan, to kind of go through them each and, and tell folks what they should be looking for, what some of the nuances are, what some of the differences are um, when we go through that. Sure, well, pattern of behavior, or maybe it's uh, gonna be called course of conduct under your stalking statute. Maybe it's gonna be called pattern uh, repeated acts or something of that nature. And uh, essentially what's here, this is often gonna be a minimum of two, in some jurisdictions, a minimum of three different acts. Uh, so because a majority of jurisdictions require at least two or more acts, uh, let's, let's stick with that. Sometimes the jurisdictions also have a requirement that these acts have to be committed over a set period of time. Sometimes they specify it has to be these repeated, these two acts have to be from what are essentially two different criminal episodes rather than the same criminal episode. Some jurisdictions say the repeated acts can be from the same episode uh, in effect. Um, sometimes these repeated acts have to be within a, a, a specified number of years. Sometimes it's left open-ended as to the number of years. But I, I always like to point out when we're thinking of pattern of behavior, now oftentimes an intimate partner of violence, uh, you're not going to have the problem of just two acts, but figuring out which of the many acts that you discover with a thorough interview and investigation. But in understanding the, the minimum threshold to get to, to meet this, is that when you respond to a domestic violence call on 911 and you find out that this victim was physically abused, you're 50% of the way towards a stalking charge in a lot of ways, because you're gonna have essentially one of those, assuming you're from a jurisdiction with two or more acts, or at least two acts, you have one of those acts uh, that are completed. And these other examples of coercive control that maybe sometimes individually are gonna be criminal offenses, but maybe independently aren't criminal offenses can be one of the other acts. So this pattern of behavior, while it's not the core of a stalking charge, it really is the gateway uh, that's gonna open uh, the offender's conduct 
open to get show the context about what happened. Stalking is the kind of charge that's going to be able to show the whole story to to the fact finder. Yeah, and I was just going to point out that some of these nuances about like timing and how many occurrences may be um, included in your case law, not your statute. I found more than in any other crime as we do my little statutory analysis stalking you really have to also do a dive into the case law because a lot of these are fleshed out including sometimes they'll talk about the pattern of behavior has to show like a continuity of purpose um and has to not include legal um things that are constitutionally protected so there can be some of these nuances i've seen cases where um like for example one of the acts was occurring at a custodial exchange where there's a supervision of children. And that was something that was deemed, you know, we can't include that in the pattern of behavior because that is something that was like legally protected. So you really wanna make sure you're looking at your case law when you're seeing, okay, how many acts do I need? Is there a case law that says two acts separated by three years is not gonna show continuity. It has to be two acts within six months. There's gonna be those nuances. And then the second piece is it has to be directed at a person, but there's some nuances here as well, right? There, there are. So the idea is that, hey, look, if uh, the, the, the different course of conduct or the pattern of behavior showing a continuity of purpose, most statutes are going to specify that it has to be against a specific person or directed person. The, the, the twist on it sometimes is directed at a person or that person's household or family member or person close to that victim, if the purpose of harassing that third party, uh, be it household, family member, or whatever, is intended to 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 harass or alarm or put the, put our victim in fear. So, in other words, there can be sort of a transient quality here where our offender can choose to direct their uh, conduct to this third party. For the purpose of victimizing our, our 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 main victim, our direct victim. But we could also have a case where they are stalking multiple people, and we're charging that as multiple people. They're stalking original victim, maybe new intimate partner, original victim's mom, and you could actually charge it as separate three stockings. Well, suppose let's let me take an easy example, and I think this would be true not in every jurisdiction. Check your local laws. <laughs> Uh, but maybe offender tries to get X upset. And so X leaves a, or offender leaves a threatening message to the X and then leaves two threatening messages to X's mother saying, tell, t tell your kid to shape up or you're going to get it. Um, now, there'd be two charges of stalking. Uh, the charge of stalking against the ex would be the one communication to our victim, as well as the two communications to the victim's mother. The charge of stalking against the mother would be the two communications to 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 the ex's mother. Mm -hmm. So we, we should almost diagram that out. I, think. <laughs> I have seen some interesting stuff just because we're like, we like to talk about emerging trends and we discussed it in our part of this series on tech facilitated abuse, uh, lots of overlap there with the stalking charges, is what do you do when you've got a case, let's say I send one email, but it's directed to 50 of my, close, of my ex's closest friends, family, and colleagues, but it was just one email and it was basically sharing some maybe embarrassing information or a photograph of my ex. Is that a pattern of behavior or is that one act? I, well, I, I would consider it sending that one email to 50 people. Um, well, I know in some jurisdictions, like essentially every, every instance, every, every other instance of conduct would be a new charge of stalking. And I think most jurisdictions would let you charge it that way. I would lean towards saying that's one instance of conduct, but bringing it all in. But I think from that fact pattern with a little digging, you're going to be able to find that second instance of conduct and still charge stalking too, to bring that in that it was sent to 50 people. Yeah. So because kind of, the act of sending it to 50 people or putting it on a bulletin board, mm -hmm. if, if it would have been posted on a community bulletin board or something, 
uh, that one act was designed to cause, and we're going to get on impact in a moment, to cause emotional distress, mental distress to the victim or to put them in fear. Yeah. Um, so whether it's shown to the, the community at large or to 50 specific people in the community, I think it's one act. Yeah. So I have seen some states where they have an additional crime of like cyber stalking, and that does address some of those uh, more widespread, you know, the internet um, you know, posting something where you see 50,000 people on it uh, may get you there. So uh, just as our laws try to keep up with the imaginations of um, perpetrators and offenders that are trying to assert this course of control and using tech, we want to keep on top of um, our statutes and our toolbox that we have as well. So the third key element is this uh, impact. And that, that does kind of range pretty greatly between states of what's considered the necessary harm or impact. So yeah, the most, the most restrictive interpretations the states are gonna require an impact of a fear of bodily injury or maybe substantial body injury. Uh, some jurisdictions are gonna be defining an aggravated or non-aggravated stock in between whether it's a fear of death or serious bodily injury or fear of bodily injury. For impact, though, I'd say the majority of the jurisdictions say that this pattern of, of behavior, this, these, this course of conduct that are directed at a specific person, it has to be intended or designed to or would cause uh, the impact of fear of bodily injury or emotional distress or sometimes mental distress or sometimes mental anguish. Um, emotional distress, that's sometimes defined as substantial emotional distress. Sometimes there's a substantial qualifier in front of it um, where that has to be carved out. Um, and we're going to get into that. But most jurisdictions are going to be recognizing that the impact, that, that the, the prohibited impact of this course of conduct is putting someone in fear of, of bodily injury or to cause them uh, um, emotional distress. And as we go through this and sort of start flushing out all these um, technicalities or you know, specifics that we see when we do our statutory analysis, I will plug that Equitas is available to conduct such statutory analysis on your behalf. We can do that sort of state level uh, close analysis for you and provide you with some resources. Um, and then the last one being that impact has to be on a person. And that seems like it should be an easy one, but there are a couple of things we need to point out here. Well, yeah, and here's what's difficult. And, and I know folks, folks are probably just gonna be only thinking of these questions in terms of their own jurisdiction statutes. Uh, but where a lot of the jurisdictions split is with this is if the impact on a person has to be by an objective standard or a subjective standard. So in other words, the question some jurisdictions might be asking, hey, this fear of bodily harm or emotional distress, does it actually have to be caused, um, which would be the subjective standard, uh, or would it be caused, or would it reasonably be expected to be caused, or would a reasonable person <coughs> have a fear of bodily injury or, uh, or, or emotional distress? Uh, as a result of the course of conduct that was directed at this specific victim. And most jurisdictions are going to be leaning towards that objective standard. Um, and, and that's going to be clear, I think, when, when we talk about some of the analysis with uh, uh, the differences between a reason, a, an objective standard and a uh, subjective standard. This can actually be, I think, one of the more um, confusing pieces uh, because even when we're talking about a reasonable person, you know, I'm thinking back to my law school days of reasonable person. Um, most, I think, we, I think it's fair to say that the majority of jurisdictions are going to use this combination of the reasonable person with all of the context or in the circumstances of our victim. And that context ends up being almost more important than the objective, reasonable, subjective kind of analysis, because it's the context that really flushes it out. So, and there, there really are, the, the, the two challenges with the impact of stalking behavior are the tendency for us to, uh, to underestimate or, 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 or not estimate correctly the impact of the stalking behavior. And I, I know the one example in, a, in, in the green room, we we're discussing it a little bit, is the idea where a, a the the offender delivers 
uh, the, the former paramour or the ex uh, a bouquet of roses. And the victim is really upset and just isolated in view in that narrow lens. You're like, what reasonable person would be upset when they get roses? And of course, the underlying context that, that shows uh, the reasonableness of that victim's fears or, or past communications that when you get roses, that's when I'm going to kill you, or, or that's, that's when you're going to have to be digging your grave or, or calling the funeral home. Um, and that's why the fear was set, was set up, just roses left randomly for the victim. And so duh, the light bulb goes off and, and, and there's understanding. Um, the flip side of the, of the reasonable person, though, is that a lot of times maybe victims get death threats and facially they appear to be shrugging it off. <laughs> or maybe then they have continuing contact with the offender and the response is, oh, well, how were you really afraid of the offender? You continued to contact them after that. So the threats really didn't scare you. Um, so you weren't really afraid. Um, but with the reasonable person standard, it's, gee, it's not whether this particular victim was afraid who may have been acclimated to a cycle of violence and abuse or might be trying to manage their own safety through by, by manage the offender in that way, but whether a reasonable person would be scared if someone says, I'm going to kill you. So even if this victim didn't have a, a, uh, a maybe the intuitive response we would expect or stereotypical response. It's not by that, that subjective evaluation, it's by whether a reasonable person would. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because you do see almost like a minimization. And so this is the impact that I had here, which was some, from some of the uh, statutes that I've looked at, you know, that emotional distress is common. You have some that are even broader that allow for like annoy or sort of the, um, a term of like molest, um, you're, you're like, mental tranquility. There's some really interesting ones out there. And then there's the ones that you said are most narrowly constructed that really require a fear of uh, death or bodily harm. Uh, some also allow for embarrassment. None of them allow for anger. I haven't seen that one yet. Um, but that is commonly what I might have seen as the first reaction when I started working with a victim. Anger um, annoyance. Um, and so how do you deal with cases or working with a victim when the first, you know, how did this make you feel, right? You think that's going to be your typical question and you'd love it to be, I was afraid I was really upset, but sometimes you work with a victim and they're, uh, this has been going on or for whatever, lots of different good reasons. Their first reaction is I'm pissed off. I'm mad. I'm angry. I just want this to stop. So I think one of the things you annoy about, rather than just asking what the, the immediate response or, 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 or reaction was, ask what they did, what they might have done differently. What did you change about your life? Did you do anything to avoid it? Did you take any precautions? Uh, did you, how did you try to manage that or control that or keep it from escalating? Uh, what did you not do so it escalate? Like, why didn't you turn your phone off? or get a new phone number, um, ask that. And then the reason, well, I didn't do that because then I'd be worried what he would do if, if, if uh, what I wouldn't be able to figure out what he's doing if I got a new phone number, or if he couldn't find me. Um, and so you do that to show the impact on a victim's life, um, what changed or alternatively, what could not change uh, because of the offender's uh, course of conduct. Mm -hmm. Cause I do feel like that anger is usually probably masking fear, uh, masking an emotional disturbance. And so those kinds of questions, I think are great to illustrate that. I do know <clears throat> most states do not require you and sometimes even specifically require some medical testimony to show or to demonstrate emotional distress. And that's good for us. Um, Cause I know at some point that was a defense challenge when using the, you know, substantial mental distress and then the defense would say, well, where's the psychiatrist or something like that? I can't think of it, and which isn't to say there isn't one. I can't think of any jurisdiction that says medical testimony is required. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, most jurisdictions are, most jurisdictions I say medical testimony or counseling is not required. Um, uh, the fraction, I think the minority are the ones that just don't address it specifically or leave it an open-ended question. Um, I, I think, uh, hopefully I'm not giving an idea to the defense bar out this when I state it, 
But the one thing I think you should sort of anticipate and being try to explain is I know a lot of definitions, the harm for emotional distress or mental distress, there's a substantial qualifier there. And you might have a defense or judge asking, well, how is this substantial emotional distress rather than just straight up emotional distress? Uh, because some jurisdictions, there, there, there's distinction in that terminology between just plain old mental distress versus substantial me mental distress. I think Virginia has some case law discussing, uh, discussing this and uh, mm -hmm. referring to the restatement uh, second of torts, which uh, brought me back to law school days when they were looking for definitions about the distinction between those two things. Um, so just be aware of that and, and uh, be, get, get to develop some arguments by, by understanding from your victim about the impact it had on their lives. Yeah, and I'll do another plug to reach out to us because the case law analysis is not only um, typically found within case law related to your stocking charge, but often you can find a lot of good language when you look at um, your civil protection orders. If your civil protection orders uh, include uh, circumstances where you can get protection for stocking uh, as an underlying, um, instead of just the violence, the stocking protection orders, then you're going to have some case law over there on the civil side of things as well. And those I find can be very rich in how they describe what level of harm is required, what types of evidence is sufficient uh, to establish that element of harm as well. So another place to look. So these may be the most <laughs> complicated um, statutory and case law analyses that we do when we are working on intimate partner uh, violence cases. So the benefits, I think you've talked to some of the benefits, but um, not all of them, because there are a lot of benefits to charging stalking. Right. I, well, one, I think if you, if you have the basis for a stalking charge, um, you get to proactively bring in all this evidence to show, to prove your elements, to prove this course of conduct, to reprove, prove these repeated acts, to show intention to put the victim in the cause emotional distress, which despite all our caveats, I think is a pretty low bar or to place the victim in fear of bodily injury. So you really open, widen, I should say, bang open the relevancy door uh, to evidence and get to show all this context in a way that I, I don't think you, uh, that you get to do pr proactively rather than asking per permission from the judge or from the court. Because a lot of 404B evidence is going to be, can I bring this evidence in? Stalking is generally going to position you with I get to bring this evidence in. Now, I would say proper preparation says, hey, look, I'm gonna be bringing in all these other acts to prove my stalking charge. Um, and it's relevant to prove it, not for the more subjective proper purpose standard we were talking about, to, but to prove an actual element of my crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so what, whatever the instant, the instant uh, acute crime that you responded to, you're gonna to get to bring in as part of stalking as well as all the, uh, the, the, uh, the pre and post conduct uh, to bring up your stalking charge, which is what's gonna be fantastic as, as well as, so it's gonna be a great way to sort of give the whole story and hopefully bring accountability for the whole conduct of the offender rather than just um, the episodic, uh, the episode. Yeah, I think it's a great strategy to capture uh, that maze of coercive control and juries, want to hear the full story. They want that context. They want to sort of look at the, the nature of their relationship. And I think prosecutors are always, um, it's, more, it's more of an advantageous position to show more of that relationship than the opposite. I know um, sometimes if all you're trying to do is this battery charge, um, you know, defense may try to say, okay, we're gonna talk about that five minutes and we'll try to, you know, in a vacuum, let's talk about those five minutes of where mm -hmm. there was this physical act of battery. And I think it's incumbent upon us to push out those limits and, and show the jury the full extent and to hold the, account of, hold the offender accountable for the full extent of their coercive behavior um, when appropriate. So I would call it, I know we, you and I have talked about it differently, but 
or the same way using different words, that a stocking charge has this effect of being an umbrella charge. And so not only can you charge the stocking, but oftentimes you can charge many of the incidents within it as well. I, I think that's a great way. I, I think a stocking charge, comparison I'd make if this helps folks, I think it's, a, it, it's the domestic violence prosecutor's friend. The same way drug prosecutors use a RICO charge, um, even though RICO charges, oh gosh, they seem so complex, there's so many elements, it makes life so hard. Uh, but from the perspective of the drug trafficking prosecutor or gang prosecutor, the reason why RICO is great is because all those elements make a lot more evidence relevant. And so it gives you a gateway to bring in more evidence. So as much fun as the drug or gang prosecutor has with a RICO or corrupt organizations charge, um, that's as, as helpful a tool as the DV prosecutor should be utilizing with stalking. I certainly would say, I mean, obviously there's always gonna be exceptions to the rules, so I don't wanna give a categorical uh, proclamation on this. It's difficult for me to, to think of a domestic violence homicide that's also not gonna have an applicable stalking charge. I mean, sure, I'm, I, there's gotta be exceptions to that statement, mm -hmm. but I, I know early in my career, um, I, I was certainly disadvantaged by some DV homicides that were prosecuted without, the, without having that stalking charge there. Mm -hmm. Where if, if I could go back and do things differently, I wish we would have included it. Mm -hmm. And I think there are some legitimate challenges. Um, most of those can be overcome with some education um, because in, you know, people's heads, stalking is probably more than two incidents in people's heads. Stalking is when a relationship is over and one person is having no contact with the other person at all. And it's all one-sided. And we know if we're talking about the course of a coercive controlling relationship, we're not going to have that one-sided evidence. Um, so that but I think that can be overcome with the educational piece and briefing the judge and really being clear on what are the statutory requirements and what is not required by the statute. And nothing in the statute requires that some person, that some half of the equation has, immediate, has completely cut off communication or um, contact with the other person. So overcoming that might be a challenge. I'd suggest, like, if, if permitted in your jurisdiction, but trying, because um, some people are conceptualizing stalking can't be perpetrated by two people if they live in the same residence, yeah. if a victim and offender are in the same residence. Unpack that during voir dire and jury selection. Uh, get some proposed points for charge, where even if your standard stalking jury charge uh, in, doesn't uh, already specify, but make sure the standard instruction from the court specifies, look, Stalking can be perpetrated even if the offender and victim live together or in the same residence, uh, which is an accurate point of law, but make sure the, uh, the jury mm -hmm. is understanding that. Um, the other challenge is, again, with, with great resources, this is almost always true, there are a lot more work. It's a lot more work talking to the victim, a lot more investigation, um, especially sometimes in some jurisdictions, you're gonna have to specify the instances of conduct you're, you're gonna be offering to make up this course of conduct. Or if you have a relationship between an offender and victim that spans decades or years, there's gonna be a lot of instances of conduct you might wanna be able to bring in. And it, it takes time to, to learn about those with the victim and with the investigation and, and develop that. But so the more complete you make your stalking charge, uh, the more work there's gonna be. Mm -hmm. And then these are, when I talk about the umbrella charge and like all the incidents underneath it, those course of conduct crimes, I thought I'd sort of close out this conversation by reminding us not to forget that we may have incidents of property damage. Um, a lot of stalking might be related to a civil protection order. So there might be violations of that protection order. Uh, case law is is very clear, uh, any, any that I have read, is that that is not, um, that, that does not violate double jeopardy and that you can charge the violation of protective order, the property damage, even if they're also listed as incidents of stalking. Um, your image exploitation uh, related crimes, your non-consensual um, distribution of intimate images, you may have a, a harassment charge 
that again, it's not double jeopardy is not a lesser included, uh, maybe better, better termed under that your assault, your batteries, but you might also have some theft, some computer crimes, all of this might be part and parcel of that course of control, thus your stocking. And you know what, in stalking and thinking of these uh, co-occurring and uh, course of conduct crimes, stalking might also give you instance to look in the beginning chapters of your crimes code that you don't often uh, peruse because you might have crimes or some uh, course instance of conduct, they occur in different jurisdictions, maybe in different states. Uh, you're gonna hear arguments you can't bring it in. Check your jurisdiction statute in the beginning of your procedural rules or crimes code where they talk about, hey, look, you where, where generally the rule is you have jurisdiction if at least one of the elements of the crime was committed in your county, your parish, your jurisdiction, or the intended result of that offense was in your county or your jurisdiction. And that's going to be, I love Jane's term, the umbrella to bring in the crimes even when they lived out of state or in the other county before they moved in. And, and keep that handy and, and keep mm -hmm. that ready for your court too when, when you're bringing in offenses from and instances of conduct from other jurisdictions. Thank you so much for bringing that up because I often will hear when we talk about stalking, especially tech related stalking, people are like, but venue. And most of the time when you go and you look at those statutes, you're, you're absolutely correct that um, if any part of it happened or the effect or intended effect happened in your jurisdiction, you're typically um, pretty well within your rights to charge it in, in that jurisdiction. So thanks for bringing that up. I think that's our conversation on course of control, although we could probably talk forever. Um, the idea being, don't just helicopter in. I'm going to steal that one from you. <laughs> um, and really have those conversations, collaborate and conduct those investigations that are going to help you identify the coercive control tactics that shape and affect and have those ripple effects on the victims you're working with. And then figure out how am I going to bring this into court? How am I going to show this maze of coercive control that the offender has created how am I going to show this, whether it's under the 404B or whether it's um, a stalking charge? Um, and please reach out to us if you have any individual questions. We love doing that type of work and statutory analysis of stalking elements is one of Jonathan's favorite things to do. <laughs> He's done a lot. Let's put Good it that times. Way. <laughs> We've got lots of additional resources including um, particular resources on prosecuting image exploitation, which is an emerging trend in coercive control relationships, uh, other uh, bad acts evidence, stalking itself, and of course, some elements of digital evidence. This is all my information. Feel free to reach out whenever. Uh, check out our website here listed again. And I'll let Jonathan plug office hours, which are the third Thursday of every month, hosted by Equitas and really meant to be a, I don't know, a networking opportunity. That's partly, I think, how, how I describe it. And first of all, Jane, thanks for letting me uh, participate in this conversation with you. And thank for everyone, thank you to everyone who's listening. But office hours, it's something we hold the third Thursday of every month. And what it's designed to be is essentially a conversation with prosecutors from across the nation off the record, it isn't recorded, but just for folks to sort of talk about uh, challenges or issues you're facing in practice or brag about your best practices or things that are going well in your jurisdiction too. We come set up with a, a sort of topic of the day that we can all uh, have conversations about, but it's really open to everything. And to sort of help you visualize what the uh, goal for this is, I sort of think of it as, 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 as the, uh, the conversations, really good conversations you've had in the lunchroom with other prosecutors when you're talking about cases. And you have a problem and some folks that you sort of just brainstorm how to, how to work around it or approach with it. And ideally, this is what office hours will end up being, uh, but just instead of a, uh, the, a, a literal lunchroom in your office with colleagues you see every day, this will be a a virtual lunchroom with prosecutors from across the country. 
I love that explanation. That was always where I did my best work in that lunchroom. So thanks again, Jonathan. Thanks for everyone for listening. Thank you, everyone. Good seeing y'all.